Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we launched in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT Conference Series, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Kamar Jaffer as our guest on SALT Talks, moderated by our good friend Huda Al-Lawadi, who joined us at our SALT Abu Dhabi 2019 conference. And we're looking forward to, have both, uh, look forward to having both of these speakers today join us at our next SALT Middle East conference, hopefully uh, at the end of 2021. But a little more about Kamar. Kamar is the uh, Council and Allen and Overy's Middle East Funds and Asset Management Group uh, with 15 years of experience in the business. She helps clients structure and establish investment funds, including Sharia compliant funds. Uh, prior to joining a and uh, Kamar was the head of legal, MENA, and Turkey at Pine Bridge Investments, a global multi-asset class manager providing cross-jurisdictional legal advice on private equity, real estate, and distribution of financial products. Uh, prior to moving to the Middle East, Kamar worked for a global law firm in London. Uh, Kamar is passionate about emerging markets and with senior industry executives has led podcasts exploring reinvigorating the MENA economy by focusing on mid-caps and SMEs and the role of private equity in emerging markets. She's also edited publications including Euro Money's Investing in Emerging and Frontier Markets. Uh, Kamar is a member of a and Middle East Diversity and Inclusion Committee and leads the gender initiative at the firm. And as I mentioned, hosting today's interview is Huda al A uh, Huda's career has spanned 18 years in private equity and investments across emerging markets. As partner at Gateway Partners Group, she is a member of the investment committee and leads deal origination, execution, and portfolio management in the Middle East and Africa regions for the firm. Uh, prior to Gateway, uh, Ms. al was the chief investment officer for Savola Group, one of the largest publicly listed strategic investment holding groups for food and retail businesses in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, she's also currently a board member at Tim Hortons Middle East and Gateway Delta Development Holdings in Africa, and has served on the boards of Panda Retail Company, Herfi, Al-Kabir, Savola Foods Company, SMG, The Entertainer, and Kudu. Among many other accomplishments, uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Neuroscience and a Bachelor of Arts degree in business economics uh, from Brown University in the beautiful town of Providence, Rhode Island. So thank you both for joining us today. Uh, Huda, I'll turn it over to you for the interview. Perfect, thank you so much, John, and thank you, Salt, for having us. Uh, thanks, Kamar, for joining. I thought it's a very good time for us to discuss fundraising in the uh, Middle East region and more broadly the emerging markets. Kamar is very well placed as a council for funds and asset management to talk to us about this. Um, you talked a little bit about what she does. Uh, I will ask her to elaborate just a little bit more to set the stage uh, for her place in terms of fundraising. She sees money coming in and out of the region. And then we'll go into the uh, discussing fundraising in more detail. Thank you, Huda. Thank you very much for having me on this whole talk. So, um, my focus is on structuring and establishing funds to raise capital for investments, as well as representing some of the institutional investors in this region that are investing into funds globally. So my clients include sovereign wealth funds, um, family offices, and other institutional investors, and also private managers that are establishing funds uh, in this part of the world. Perfect. Thank you for that. So, Kamar, you basically help people like me who want to do deals or raise money actually turn that into reality. That's and in right. that context, uh, if we just look at the uh, big picture over the last 12 months, the very eventful COVID year that we've had, what, how do you see the environment, the fundraising environment, whether it's from a manager perspective or an investor perspective? So I would say that generally uh, for the Middle East, fundraising has been challenging in 2020. We've seen it pause initially when COVID-19 hit uh, in the initial months from March, April, uh, May. And then, um, we, you know, we've started seeing much more of a positive outlook on fundraising as, um, as managers are structuring and establishing funds and going to markets and closing their funds as well. 
to what we've seen last year is that um, managers and investors transition to a remote world and have been holding, um, sort of have been doing their due diligence together remotely. And that's been very positive. So there's been engagement from both sides and we've seen um, managers trying to do this in a very efficient way. And um, we've also seen that the, the trend we've been seeing, which is very aligned with what we're seeing internationally, is that investors continue to allocate to very well-known and established managers, as well as um, ones that they have pre-existing relationships with. So they tend to re-up with, with the managers they know. Uh, we've seen a lot more difficulty for first-time first or emerging managers that are looking to, to start their first fund, for example. And that's, that's where the trend is. And that's very much in line with what we've seen as well. Do you see that changing or in the recent months, or do you think that's going to continue being the case so long as we can't physically travel and do due diligence on new, um, uh, you know, the investors can't do due diligence on new names? I think that what, um, I think that managers are trying to be as reactive as they can to investors' needs. And I think that they're looking at alternative models as well to raise capital. So if they can't raise it by raising a blind pool fund, they look at, for example, a deal by deal structure or a pledge fund structure in order to get to, for example, in a deal by deal structure, they'll have a pre-identified investment and they'll look to get their investors comfortable with the, um, with the investment, get them to invest and build their track record in that way by making um, those sort of uh, deal by deal structures and then with a view to perhaps seeding their first fund. So I think that we're seeing that managers are trying to adapt to the current markets. Great. And on those sort of deal by deal uh, uh, situations, is it the, are the economics similar? Is it uh, very much uh, per situation? How does it work? Yeah. So on the deal by deal structures, I think that there isn't a very set market um, market terms like there is on the fund slide. And um, so I think we see that managers. Um, do this in different ways and it depends on whether they've had the track record whether they've done this before whether investors know them and whether they've got a pipeline as well so i think there are many factors that it come into play but we do see for example a closing uh, fee that gets put in place and of course the carry those are typical um, structures we still see in those deals and then then after that, the range of what those are will differ depending on, on the manager. So going away from the how and the investment structures, getting into what in terms of the uh, industry verticals or the investment strategies that you see uh, having the most traction, uh, where would that be in your view, either in the Middle East or broadly emerging markets? Sure. So on what we've been seeing is that the managers that have um, that are established, that have a track record, um, they tend to be able to raise their successor funds. And those can go in, those can be in PE, in private equity, credit. Um, they can be in uh, venture capital and the list goes on. But I think where we're seeing a lot of um, new sort of interest is, for example, on the technology side. So we're seeing a lot of interest in, in, in VC and tech uh, with a view to investing in, in sectors like edutech, um, healthcare, so health tech, uh, agri-tech, uh, fintech. All of those are attracting a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention in the region. Now, you talk about attracting attention, which takes us now to the who, and I, I'm just trying to sort of... Uh, understand where that interest is coming from is that you know you know you have uh, families sovereigns international local where is the interest today who are the active pockets let's say so um i think sovereign wealth funds continue to allocate uh, so they have continued to allocate both regionally and internationally to funds and they continue to do so uh, in particular to help in, in to help diversify the economy and that continues. Family offices also continue to invest both regionally and globally. And again, they're trying to diversify their business uh, businesses away from their traditional areas of focus. Um, we're also seeing, um, we do see some interest from US and European players that, are in, that have invested with managers in the region and continue to do so. And those are the ones that have had experience of, of investing in the Middle East or emerging mar markets. 
and they continue to, to invest, particularly with managers that they know. And then DFIs, I think in particular, are continuing to, uh, to invest in markets such as Egypt and Africa um, to, um, to sort of help support their agenda as well. And how about outward investment from the Middle East? So outward investment, we're seeing a lot of interest in US and Europe. So those are the big fundraising markets at the, at the moment. And I think that those the sectors that we see a lot of interest in are um, credit. So special situations, dislocation funds have attracted um, capital from the region. Um, and we're also seeing this across sectors. So it doesn't necessarily need to be um, sort of just a credit fund. It will be uh, a special a specific industry or um, area that they're allocating to. And what's interesting here is that we're seeing some of the, the sovereign investors that want to deploy capital very quickly in specific industries or strategies. They invest through um, separate manager accounts, so SMAs with managers, which means that they give a big ticket size to the manager uh, to invest. And it's effectively investing as a fund of one, let's say, into specific uh, specific areas. And just uh, parking on, on the sovereigns for, for a few minutes, um, we've seen the likes of Mubadala and PIF talk about doubling AUM. We've seen pockets such as Jeddah and Catalyst come out and say that they're going to support the local managers and develop the industry further. Have you seen that translate into activity? Have you seen that translate into allocation? And what, if any, impact does that have on the terms that managers have to sign up to when they bring in pockets like that? So I think we're seeing these seed funds, which is a relatively un unusual feature, I think, which is part of our region, uh, becoming very active. And I think that that is, um, that is great for, for managers because they have that support uh, system in play. And those those seed funds are very active in promoting their ecosystem, uh, whether it be in Saudi, in the UAE, or in Bahrain or elsewhere. And I think that they um, they invest, but they will basically allocate, but also have other investors join. And so the negotiation with the manager will not necessarily just be with a seed investor. It will also need to cater to other investors that are joining the fund. So it will have to be on the basis of market market terms. And do and is there a domicile requirement associated with all of them or some of them? Are there any uh, localization requirements that this comes with? So I think, as you know, regionally we've seen historically Cayman Islands being the dom the preferred domicile for funds in the region, and um, and what we have seen re in recent years is that the financial centres in the region are attracting uh, managers because they're closer to home. Uh, so they have their teams locally based uh, in the region and those continue to attract those managers. They're based on, on common law international standards. Uh, so they provide comfort and at the same time, they allow 100% foreign ownership of managers. So they can set up their funds and have the ability to um, adapt the terms of their fund documents. So I think it's very similar to what you would have in the Cayman Islands in terms of a legal regulatory framework uh, in, in, in a way. And I think that those um, jurisdictions will continue to attract uh, managers and that will also enable them to continue to raise capital from the region. And when you talk to international pockets and talking about these jurisdictions and the new jurisdictions, uh, do you see resistance? Are people wary of the lack of history, lack of precedence? So I think we do see international investors uh, looking at the region and um, investing in the region. But we also see that at times there may be some investors that are very used to investing in, um, in other parts of the world. And so they prefer to use their domiciles. So we do establish, for example, a fund named fund, let's say, in the region, with a parallel fund in Luxembourg to cater for European investors. So we do have, uh, we do structure in such a way to be able to attract different types of investors depending on their requirements. And I think this is just, this is driven by different factors, including tax as well. 
And talking about catering to, to, so, you know, this is tax or other reasons, people being used to domiciles, another pocket of investors that I know I asked you a lot of questions I got about and, 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 uh, pick your brains on as a Sharia investors. Do you think that that's a pocket that's being tapped enough or, uh, successfully, unsuccessfully? Do you see it as an impediment? Do you see it as an opportunity? How, how do you view that? So I would say that most of the funds we, about 50% of the funds we work on are Sharia compliant funds in the region or structures to tap into those investors. And um, I think it's, it is um, an opportunity, uh, definitely, in terms of tapping into those, those investors. I think it's a challenge in terms of understanding the requirements. So um, Sharia compliance, I would say, is an art, uh, not a science. So many of the investors will have different requirements depending on their Sharia board. And the Sharia board also has um, um, a different, uh, different views of what Sharia compliance is, which evolve over time. So certain investors will only invest in fully Sharia compliant funds and others uh, may be comfortable at the other end of the spectrum with excuse rights. Uh, whereby they will not invest, uh, they will invest in a conventional fund, but they will not, um, they will be excused from investments that are not Sherry compliant. And then there are some other options in between. So we do see some investors uh, requiring parallel funds to be set up, um, which is some of the, the structures we've been discussing, or using a, a debt financing instrument, so financing instrument to access the conventional fund to be one step removed from the conventional fund effectively to invest into, um, into, uh, into that. Um, so I think overall, there are different ways of approaching Sharia investors, and it's important to really understand what, they, what their requirements are. Do you see that getting streamlined as more, uh, that there's a more interest and more activity in this Sharia pocket? Or do you think people will continue to have their own requirements? I think they will continue to be their own requirements because depending on the t on the investors, their jurisdictions across emerging markets, not just you know the Middle East but also Asia, they will all have their own um, specific requirements. And the Sharia scholars who advise the investors as well um, have evolving uh, views of what Sharia of Sharia law over time, and that really sort of also impacts the, the structuring too. Zeroing in on the terms, whether it's a Sharia compliant fund or, or a conventional fund, have you seen specific fund terms evolve over the last 12 months? Uh, yes. I mean, firstly, the time to close um, has extended. So we've seen that extend beyond the 12, typical 12 months. So we see that go to 18, 24 months in some cases. Um, so that's, and we've seen sort of a lot of discussion between managers and investors as to whether they hardwire the period in, whether they build in flexibility to get investor consent to extend it and all of those types of um, things. Um, we're also seeing a lot of discussion around the investment mandates. So managers are going back to their investors and trying to negotiate um, to have a broader investment mandate in order to capitalize on opportunities or to invest across the capital structure of companies. So that's another area um, that we're seeing movement on. And then there's also the investment period that may be longer because it may take more time to exit in the current markets. And that has also knock-on effects because you may have need to look at the definition of follow-on investments if you want to continue to invest in your portfolio companies. And there are restrictions and terms around that. And so just looking at what that means. Um, and then I think that generally... Um, there's on the economic terms, those tend to be fairly aligned with where we were before, and those continue to be um, sort of in, in not necessarily very strongly affected, especially for established uh, managers as to what they were before COVID 19. So, side letters there, more or less? They're still very long. <laughs> They're still very long. That, still that's always the pain point, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, talking about uh, uh, structures, another area that has seen a lot of activity and actually has boomed is facts. Yes. Uh, sitting here in the Middle East, what do you see? 
So I think we're definitely seeing a lot of interest in special purpose acquisition vehicles, uh, companies, so SPACs. Uh, in the US, as you know, we've um, the numbers of SPACs that have come to the market last year were significant. I mean, there were over 240, I think, uh, SPACs raising over $80 billion are some of the numbers that I've read. And um, I think that has attracted investor interest in the region. Um, and we are seeing some investors looking to invest in, in SPACs. I think what has given uh, brought a lot more investor familiarity are some of the players that have some of the high profile names of uh, business leaders, as well as PE sponsors that have been backing the SPACs. And um, I think that is also sort of um, attracting a lot more interest. And we're seeing a multitude of structures, as you've said. So some would be sponsored individual, individually and others through, through uh, PE, through the private equity um, firms as well. And in terms of uh, SPACs, you mentioned managers and private equity players being involved in that. Is that typically done as private equity players doing a new activity or is that, that done through funds or, you know, is the fund the SPAC sponsor or is the private equity manager? We've seen individuals do it. What if, or is it a mix? I think I would say it's a mix. Um, so I think I um, would say that what we're seeing on the SPAC side is that um, the, the, the team is key uh, in terms of, of the fundraising. And that's the, that's sort of one of the, the key aspects because they have to identify the target within 24 months. Um, so the, the question is whether that team has the pipeline to be able to, uh, to do so. So if I were a, uh, talking to you from the point of view, and I'm going to ask you this from a few perspectives, if I were talking from the perspective of an international investor looking to put money here, what would be the things that you would tell me to focus on? So I think it's 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 similar to every other market in the world, right? So it's uh, basically it's the team, the the, the manager's performance on, on other funds, the whether it's um, how it's dealt with uh, sort of crises, let's say, in uh, previous times. So whether how they've dealt with the financial crisis over time, how they've dealt with COVID, how they've managed their portfolio companies. I think there'll be a lot of focus on the portfolio, the existing portfolio investments and how they stand and how managers are, are supporting those. And also looking at the pipeline, trying to understand how the managers are actually continuing to secure a pipeline across a broad range of geographies um, and able to actually diligence those and how they've put processes in place to, to assist them on, on all of that. And if I flip that and ask you from the point of view of somebody who's raising money, as a manager, what would your advice be? Um, so I think as a, from a manager perspective, I think the importance is really to, um, to highlight those success stories, like basically the transition to the virtual world, the support that has been provided to the portfolio companies, you know, where the portfolio companies are 12 months later. I think it's all about continuing communication and engagement with investors keeping them up to date to give them um, to give them more in, to be more transparent and I think that and just the future pipeline and you know the, the, the dialogue that they have with those management teams as well given we still are um, find it, there are still travel restrictions in place and you you touched on portfolio management and the focus on that from the investor side and you also touched on um, longer in that potentially longer holding period because of you know inability to exit uh have you seen conti uh, continuation funds or way people looking for to manage the end of life uh, for funds during this period so yes we are talking to uh, players that are looking at continuation funds for assets where they see opportunity for growth um, and so they would look to uh, transfer them into a fund and um, either roll over their existing investors and bring on uh, new investors to those. Um, so I think that there are those discussions going on. Um, and so I think it's, it's really a question of the underlying targets and the opportunities um, there as to whether it's successful or not. Are they difficult conversations? 
I think it's a question also of just being able to um, to manage so, so to manage the existing investors on one side, um, getting the necessary approvals and consent, and also just uh, managing the new investors. So there are the conflicts of interest provisions that are in fund documents, and just understanding how to navigate all of those issues, valuation as well, making sure that the valuation is. Um, on the made by an independent third party to be able to provide comfort when the, the asset gets transferred to the uh, continuation vehicle. So I think all of those issues have to be properly sort of addressed. Right. Good. But well, thank you so much, Kamar, for your views. I think that you know that gives a great uh, overview of what's happening and what you're seeing, and really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge. Thank you John, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kamar, and thank you, uh, Huda, for joining us. It's always great to touch base with our friends in the Middle East. We haven't gotten to see enough of your faces, obviously, during COVID, but look forward to hopefully getting over to see you guys soon in beautiful Dubai and uh, resuming our conference series, as I mentioned, uh, in late 2021. So thank you both for participating today in Salt Talks. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, who joined us today uh, on Salt Talks with Huda Al-Lawadi and Kamar Jaffer. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode or any of our previous episodes, and we've had plenty of guests hailing from the Middle East, a region that we're very uh, familiar with and, and that we like a, a great deal, you can access all those Salt Talks at salt.org backslash talks. You can also sign up for all of our future talks there if you want to participate uh, in these episodes live. And just a reminder, please follow us on our YouTube channel, where Salt Tube is the name of our YouTube channel. We're also on Twitter, which is where we're most active, at Salt Conference. We're also uh, on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram as well. So please follow us there, and please spread the word about Salt Talks. We love growing our community, especially in new places, which we've uh, done a lot more in the Middle East over the last few years. So uh, love growing our community there. Uh, and on behalf of the entire Salt team and our guests today, this is John Darcy signing off for today from Salt Talks. We hope to see you back here soon.